Thank you, attendees. Thank you, Surf Pro Boise, our webinar sponsor today. And thank you, Melanie and marketing teams, as well as our research teams. Before we start, I want the attendees to know that we'll be fielding questions during the webinar. To ask a question, please view the Q&A drop box in the corner of your screen, or it might be below, uh, kind of somewhere down below. Uh, as a group intro, I want to start out with Devin. Hello, everyone. Excited to be on this call. Uh, my name is Devin Ogden. I got into commercial brokerage in 2001. I've been focused on industrial sales, leasing investments uh, for the past 13 years. And on a personal level, I have four kids that I love uh, spending time with outside. And, and one of my pet peeves is when people don't use the merge lane. <laughs> All right, Devin. Steve. Uh, hi, my name is Steve Foster, and I was raised here in the Boise area. I moved uh, down, relocated to the Bay Area in the early uh, 90s and got into commercial real estate down there in Silicon Valley. I think I spent about 16 years doing that before moving back here, back home uh, in 2002. And I've been doing the industrial uh, leasing and sales stuff here since. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Michael. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael McKnight. I've been with Collier's Idaho for four years now. I primarily focus on the sale and leasing of industrial properties, and I am a proud Bronco alum. Thanks, Michael. Josh. Morning, everyone. My name is Josh McFadden. Uh, short kind of history on my entry into real estate is I grew up in the Pacific Northwest area, graduated from University of Washington in 1998. Uh, promptly moved to California for some sunshine and a different lifestyle and got into the business with Colliers International there that October. And I've been specializing in industrial real estate ever since then. And then just four months ago, moved to the Boise area with my family and are um, starting a new chapter out here. Great. Thanks, Joe. Lou. Hi, all. I'm uh, Lou Goldman. I'm an investment sales advisor. Uh, I've been with Colliers for 16 years now. Uh, I work in all asset classes and have closed deals in 28 states across the country. Approximately 50% of my business is done here in the Valley, while the rest is spread throughout the U.S., although a majority would be here in the, the Mountain West and Northwest. Thanks, Lou. Hi, all. My name is Jake Tucker. I've been at Collier since 2007, and I specialize in industrial sales and leasing. I'm also a Boise native and um, enjoying my time here. I guess we'll get started now. Um, we're going to do a few questions here that we've got for our panelists, and then uh, we'll open up the, uh, the end for some questions that are uh, uh, come in through the webinar. Uh, question from Michael. Michael, as 2020 began, the Treasure Valley was one of the hottest commercial real estate markets in the country. Then COVID-19 is. Now here we sit in October, focusing on leasing. Please take us through the changes in the market, where we are now, how did we get there, and what's your crystal ball prediction for the next 12 months? Sure, thanks Jake. So during a year of being faced with uh, so many unforeseen challenges, the industrial leasing market has stayed active, outperforming most other product types in Idaho. Industrial vacancy rate is currently sub 3% and that continues to compress as 2020 comes to an end and we look to 2021. As the vacancy rate tightens, lease rates have stayed consistent, 65 to 70 cents, triple net. While it is known that we are experiencing an influx of out-of-state users, there is a lot of organic growth as well. Um, In-state users are benefiting from the strong industrial market as most industrial users were deemed essential businesses um, through this global pandemic. Leasing size requirements have continued to increase as well this year our industrial team, we've seen several RFPs for users looking for 100,000 square feet plus and looking to expand or enter into the Treasure Valley market. Looking to next year, 2021, um, I'm bullish on the Treasure Valley and the industrial market. We will see an increase in spec development as well as continued tenant demand. Great. Thanks, Michael. Question for you, Steve, kind of the same, same thing, but focusing on industrial purchases, please take us through the changes you've seen in the last, you know, six to eight months. Where are we now? How did we get there? And what's a crystal ball prediction for you for the next 12 months? Yeah, Jacob, uh, I don't see much of a change in uh, the purchase uh, 
requirements out here. It's there's still uh, the supply versus demand issue. Um, in my time in the business, which is 25 plus years, I've never uh, witnessed a lack of industrial oriented companies looking to buy versus lease. That demand is always there. Um, you know, warehouse building, couple it with excess fenced yard, you've got a hot commodity. However, the uh, biggest challenge facing these buyers is supply, and, and that's never changed. Um, types of companies that always seem to be in the market to own versus lease are HVAC companies, fencing companies, roofers, piping companies, professional lawn care, et cetera. Um, but again, faced with lack of product. Uh, from a pricing standpoint, that's changed. Uh, that's done nothing but increase over the last year or so, or, or even beyond that. Gone are the $70 to $80 a square foot industrial building purchase opportunities. Uh, we are easily $100 per square foot minimum. Um, case in point, as I understand it, uh, soon to go under contract, is uh, I'll give you an example of 22,000 square foot. And again, quality and location are key to these high prices. Um, 22,000 square feet, great central Boise location, owner user opportunity, excess fence, paved gated yard, uh, listed a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks ago, three offers in the first week. And as I understand it, it will be going under contract at above asking, um, the buyer will be an out of state industrial oriented company wanting to come into Boise. And that price will be above $125 a square foot. So prices we haven't seen before, uh, moving forward, those prices aren't going to change. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that, that supply will not be there. The demand will always be there. And uh, so I just see that being a very strong market from a seller standpoint the rest of this year and next. Thank you for your time. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, like Steve mentioned, I mean, pricing of 125 bucks a foot is is definitely the highest we've seen in a long time or ever. Uh, question for Josh. Josh, based on your experience, why do you think Boise is seeing an increase in investment from out-of-state investors who are traditionally focused on larger West Coast markets like the Bay Area, Portland, Seattle, and Salt Lake? Thanks, Jake. Um, and let, let's put an asterisk next to based on my experience, because I haven't been in this market very long yet, but I have spent a lot of time kind of driving the market and talking to a lot of people out of the market about Boise. I mean, more than anything, you just, Boise comes up in conversation much more than it ever did. And you, you heard that on the first part of the seminar today, but um, I, mean, I think opportunity is the best way to describe it. In a unique to a market of this size, a smaller size market growing into a more strong medium sized market, you have attributes like excess land, yard space, buildings that aren't maxed out coverage on sites like you'd see in some of the more pick through markets that um, developers want to, you know, take the extra parking and yards off the table. In Boise, we still have those and there's still an ability to develop properties with those attributes. Um, and just if driving in the market, you just see looking around, you know, let's use the word vintage, for example, you'll see older buildings of a certain vintage that have not been repositioned numerous times and resold. A lot of them are original owners, or maybe the company who built them for their own use is still occupying them. When those turn, there's an opportunity to improve the aesthetics, reposition the property to get better market rents. I think the out of the area, um, interested parties can see that opportunity once they get out here and see with their own eyes. Um, and then lastly, you know, if construction costs are, let's say on a par in the bigger markets with here, once you take land out of the equation, land here being a, a lower price point is still attractive to some of the people who are, you know, A, can't find land in the bigger markets and B, land's going to be in the, you know, high teens up to $30 a foot mark in some of those um, larger West Coast markets were here, you could still find land arguably in the three to eight dollar a foot range, depending on what part of town. And um, I think people are still excited about that. Yeah, Steve, Steve uh, showed that in one of the slides, uh, our national director of research showing the price of land discrepancies between some of the larger markets. So that's a good point. Um, a question for Lou, 
Lou, what does the current appetite for investors look like for industrial product here in the Treasure Valley? And where are current cap rates for both single tenant and multi-tenant industrial properties? Sure, uh, thanks Jake. Uh, there's currently no shortage of buyers looking for industrial product in our market. Industrial was arg arguably the hottest investment category before COVID hit and has only become more desirable based on the acceleration of e-commerce, last mile logistics, manufacturing, and our robust housing market, which supports hundreds of contractors who occupy a large amount of industrial space. Um, cap rates continue to compress due to low inventory and an abundance of buyers. These consumers rate, range from institutional level to first time investors who've never owned commercial property. Single tenant net leased investments, which uh, have a strong corporate guarantee, a lease term greater than five years, will trade as low as a five and a half cap, while multi-tenant industrial with sound fundamentals will, will trade in the six cap neighborhood. Regardless of deal metrics or the location, it is challenging to find anything above a seven cap. Uh, over the last year, the average cap rate overall in the industrial market is a 6.1 cap. With rents rising and investor demand soaring, the average per square purchase price for industrial has grown significantly. Not too long ago, you would raise a red flag when seeing industrial building trade above $115 per, uh, per square foot mark. Now we're seeing product transact as high as $180 per square foot. The combination of lower cap rates and higher rents has driven this change. Uh, there's little question that the local industrial market will remain strong for the foreseeable future based on, uh, excuse me, regardless of how the pandemic uh, continues to unfold. The combination of Boise's growth and the need for businesses to deliver product to their consumers quicker and quicker will make industrial one of the safer and more dependable investments moving forward. Thanks, Lou. Yeah, I mean, we were all kind of roundtabling yesterday in a discussion that we had, and this is the first time that we've seen uh, it in our market where a vacant building, uh, the value of a vacant build, building sometimes can exceed the value of a uh, fully leased investment building based off of when the leases were signed, the, rent, the rental rates that were signed at. And if the, the tenant had multiple renewal options, sometimes I mean, that's the first time we've ever seen a vacant building be worth more than a lease investment. So it's kind of, it's an interesting time. A uh, couple questions here that we, we got uh, before the webinar today is, um, and also if you don't have a question or if you have a question, please uh, fill one out on the Q&A section of our webinar here. But uh, how are construction costs affecting the industrial market currently? And this is kind of open-ended for everyone. Steve, why don't you start, uh, Michael, why don't you start us off on how construction costs are kind of hindering the market currently? Well, uh, as we have kind of see through this past year, lumber and construction costs have increased. So it's created some sort of a bottleneck for people to kind of come in and build new construction. We have the demand there for users and tenants, but it's, it's really difficult for most parties right now to come into our market on um, paper land, land prices are increasing. And then add on top of that rising construction costs, it just has really created a bottleneck effect for us getting you know, the supply to keep pace with the demand that we're seeing. Right, and to kind of snowball off of that, I mean, from a marketing perspective, it makes it tough for us to, to really come out with a pre-marketing package and, and display pricing on a, on a product when that pricing could change based off of the construction costs and when the actual bids are inked. Um, and we're seeing price increases every couple months, especially lumber and steel. So that's a good point. Um, I think we have a, an example of that is it, we sold a little three acre piece in Southeast Boise to uh, an owner user presently leasing, uh, wanted to build this, a 23,000 square foot building and he put it on hold due solely to construction. Well, perhaps the pandemic has something to do with that, but construction costs have just said, I'm going to wait right now uh, and see how this, how this pans out. So good point with good point on that. Yeah. And permitting as well. I mean, we're seeing about an eight week lag on permitting currently in the city of Boise, which is kind of creating a little bit of a, an issue with trying to fill uh, these spaces that might be kind of in shell condition. Um, so between construction costs and all the um, other issues with building, it's kind of difficult right now. Um, Josh, if you're an investor looking for a sub cap rate or sub 6% cap rate, 
uh, type of deal and you're looking at Boise, but you're also looking at larger markets, which market would you choose and why? And, and I know Lou, you might have a point to this as well. So let's open up that discussion. Managers mess with me on the left here. <clears throat> um, if you're an out of market investor, I mean, on here, we've talked about this both sides pro and con is if cap rates are kind of on a par with a bigger West Coast city and Boise, just because of the supply and demand of certain asset types, you know, there's an argument you'd, you'd run to the, the bigger, more developed market because it's matured and it's got more of a track record. I would maybe argue the other side as well, that we, we're on more of a growth curve. Um, there's more fish in our pond still. There, there's more to come in the future than there would be to some of those markets where you've had investors come in, mature a property, sell it, move on. And then the next guy comes in at a higher basis and it just, it kind of anchors the, the meat on the bone is a little bit gone there where I'd say in Boise, it just feels like there's a lot of opportunity ahead for us. So if you're buying at a similar cap rate, you can put in a little elbow grease and improve that in, in a reasonable amount of time, I would expect. Perfect, thank you. Hey, Devin, do you think we're in the peak of the market? You know, it, it kind of feels that way, but I don't think so. Um, I think I always say that uh, it seems like as of late, we always, as brokers, we know so much, we know what things have sold for. And so we always think back and say, well, we always look in kind of hindsight, but right now it's like, yeah, these, these prices, the lease rates are the highest they've been. The sell prices, we're seeing prices of building sell that are higher than we've ever seen before. But um, you look at the, the momentum behind it and what's, what's driving it. And I think this is just kind of more of, I think this is going to be driving for uh, more, you know, when, when the, when it, pauses or plateaus or it has a little bit of a downturn, I think it's, you know, it's, we're going to see that at some point, but I don't think we're going to be seeing that here in the next year or so. Right. I agree with you. I mean, I think we're just going to continue to, to chip, chip along on our, on our pace that we're on. And, um, uh, go ahead. I just going to add a little bit more about kind of uh, this, the spec development uh, the side of things, because it kind of relates to all this kind of what we've been discussing, but you know, during the recession for, for over eight years, we didn't see any spec development going on. And it wasn't until the past few years when the lease rates jumped up um, and you have the strong tenant demand that Michael talked about earlier, that we started seeing that spec development with, um, you know, with Strider Group doing their projects in Southeast Boise and out in the Sky Ranch development in Caldwell, um, with Adler Industrial, who purchased the Van Acker um, company uh, portfolio. You know, they, they put up buildings in uh, Meridian and Nampa. Um, you also had, you know, Bayside Capital built four buildings, four facilities in the West Airport area that can accommodate smaller users. And there's other developers that uh, are doing projects to, in West Boise. But we also have seen that, like, new entrants to the market. You know, significant, significant players, um, like a Boyer Company out of Salt Lake City, is doing a, developing the city owned land out by in Southeast Boise by the Winco Distribution Center and recently, recently completed their, uh, the first building of 168,000 square feet and is planning on building more. You also have AT Industrial came in the market and built a 87,000 square foot building in Caldwell. Um, and all these developers that I mentioned, they're all, they're positioned to, to continue to do more spec development in, here in 2021. Like we've talked about, the demand's there. Um, and we're also seeing, uh, just in addition to that, we've seen um, just last week, we represented a, a new buyer out of Sacramento, uh, LDK Ventures, that closed on the 350,000 square foot Chaco Distribution Center in Boise. And they're going to be taking care of all the deferred maintenance and making that available for tenants. Um, and they also have uh, additional land there that they can build another 200,000 plus square foot building. And it's also worth mentioning that BVA, who historically has not done industrial development, you know, controls good chunks of land uh, that could also be put in play. Correct. So, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the past, I think it's worth, worth noting now, is you're mentioning the larger uh, space divisions that are going to be available where people are coming out and they're delineating down to about 50,000 square feet as a minimum. I mean, I remember eight, 10 years ago, we were recommending uh, developers build right around that 10,000 square foot sweet spot. Seems like we've definitely increased on our size requirements. One thing I do want to note is that there's significant demand and a lot of, and, and real lack of product for anything under 5,000 square feet. 
that's worth a dang. Um, there's not much out there. If you're a 5,000 square foot tenant who needs both grot, um, dock high and grade level loading, your options are, are maybe one, two, or three, and, and typically they have activity on them already. So I'd like to express that as also a, a need that we have here in the local valley on top of our, our larger product. Um, here's a question that we have is, uh, what are the pricings, uh, specifically what are industrial land prices and how do they differentiate between submarkets like Southeast, Boise, Meridian, Nampa, Caldwell? I'll open that up for you guys. I'll, I'll jump in first and I think I mean, it, it will vary depending on obviously where it's at. If you're on the periphery, it's going to be less, but also it's just, uh, um, is it already entitled yet? Is it the right zoning? Do you have utilities to it? That That's going to really affect the price as well. If you have a lot of offsite costs to bring in utilities and roads, it's, you know, that price of that land is going to be going to be lower, but, but generally, you know, on the peripheries, it's going to be, it's going to be the, the cheaper rent or the cheaper price per square foot. And then more towards the middle of the middle of the valley near the interchanges is where you're going to get that premium. And that's where we see that, that $8 a square foot. And that's generally going to be owner users that are paying that, um, that, uh, that high price of eight, you know, for, for investors to buy it at current market rents to buy at $8 a square foot, it's tough to make a pencil, um, with the current lease rates. So they're the, the bigger developers need to be, they need to buy land for cheaper than the owner users. Yeah. And I mean, we're seeing small little half a, there was a half acre industrial lot. One of the last ones available over off of South Cole and Lem High. Uh, the purchase or the asking price was $10 a foot. I believe it traded for higher than that. So yeah, industrial land pricing has definitely gone up and to kind of snowball off of what you mentioned regarding land entitlements. I mean, that's really, we've mentioned it before. Um, if you look around the Valley, we might have a lot of land that could be deemed industrial at some point in time, but it's currently not annexed or entitled. And until that happens, you know, we're going to continue to see these land prices maintain high because there's not very many options out there to look at. So um, that's something that uh, is worth talking about. Um, let's see here. We got one other question and Josh men mentioned it earlier. He, he talked about repositioning of industrial assets. Can we go into a little bit further about that, Josh? Maybe like touch a little bit more in terms of um, you know, remodeling your industrial property to increase the value. Yeah, I mean, like I said, from the North County San Diego market I'm coming from in the last, call it full market cycle, you've just seen a lot of guys really get creative on how to spend some smart money to improve the aesthetics and the function of older real estate. And that might be a new roof, it might be scraping and um, repainting new signage program on building exteriors to kind of liven up the image a little bit slurring and redoing parking lots. If there was an old fenced year area, making it secure and making it really attractive to where people are willing to pay a premium rent in exchange for getting that attribute of the building. Um, and, you know, previous to that, when I first moved to the area, things were still a little sleepy there. And it, it reminded me then of how Boise is now when you drive around, it's like people weren't charging for yards, signage wasn't important, proximity didn't play as big a role. And you can kind of see where we are on the curve as it relates to that. So I would say in drive around, there's a lot of opportunity to spend some smart money and your return on that is you're gonna get better market rents instead of being in the lower echelon of industrial classes, you can kind of move up a step or two. And, you know, as we're all talking about rents increasing by lack of supply, if you take an old building and, and pump a few TI dollars into it, you're gonna capitalize the rents a lot better. Yeah, and I, I mean, Michael, you guys have a good case study of that on your project on Franklin and South Cole. I mean, I remember when I first got into the business 13 years ago, you were getting maybe 40 cent triple net rents there, maybe a little bit higher for some of the product that's more heavy office. But I mean, you guys are seeing rents there at 90 cents to a dollar a foot triple net, and it's basically full. So I think that's a, a good example of the product that you guys have brought to market over the last three years that has uh, the owner has seen an increase in his ability to, um, you know, increase the value of the asset by just doing a little, you know, sweat equity for lack of a better term. Right. No, you're exactly right, Jake. And speaks to the demand, the tenant demand that you mentioned earlier in that kind of smaller ride size range, a thousand square feet up to, you know, five to even eight. 
Um, yeah, uh, our you know, it just speaks to kind of that and just the basic aesthetics you can do to kind of push rents and keep occupancy high. Yeah, and, and I think part of the issue with having uh, a lack of product in the smaller square footage range is that people are building it. It's just being absorbed or being purchased. You know, they, they bring it out to market for lease and some guy offers them, you know, an off market price or, you know, something that makes them free up that asset. And that's happening where it's getting built, but it's getting absorbed as fast as it's getting right. built. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you guys want to say? Well, I'll just I'll tag on just kind of what the last thing you're saying, but I was just thinking about it is um, some of these developers aren't going to do the smaller stuff. I mean, right. The smaller product, it costs more to do. Um, and it's just kind of a different beast. And so, so some of these bigger players are not getting into that. Um, and the challenge they're having is like you mentioned before, is this, is finding larger parcels of land. They can actually, they want to go out and do, build bigger, big box, uh, you know, banking on this thing, like, you know, Lou met, had mentioned about, you know, with e-commerce, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg there with distribution and how everyone's expecting their product to them, you know, this immediately. And so everyone's scrambling to, to have these uh, distribution houses. So everyone, so the developers are trying to build those, but you build a, to larger scale, you can get the economies of scale on the cost on the construction cost of the site, which makes helps make the, the project pencil better. Um, because it, the price per square foot on construction of a bigger building is going to be less than these smaller buildings. And so that's they're just hanging on to that and not going into the smaller uh, building the smaller buildings that are cut up small. Correct. I mean, the the largest e commerce player that we all know about, uh, who wasn't in our valley uh, two years ago now, well, in a few months, we'll occupy almost 800,000 square feet of distribution space after they uh, move into their space in Southeast Boise. So that's a good, good trend. Yeah. And they continue, about. you know, they continue, you know, they continue growing, but like, you know, we've helped Amazon with all, you know, their transactions, but they're across the country. You talk to any, any city that they're, they're just absorbing space left and right, but it's not just them. You're getting FedEx is growing. All these shipping uh, companies are all growing, um, and I think that's that's going to be a, a trend that we're just going to see for years to come. Hey, Devin, I'm not sure if we touched on it, but uh, an interesting point is the Strider Group's um, plans to go ahead and build 200,000 square feet in Southeast Boise on the land that they bought years ago um, at auction, I believe. Their uh, smallest increment is going to be 53,000 square feet. Just like you're saying, and moreover, um, the clear height is going to be 36 feet, which we, that's the first time I've seen a developer do that. So he's obviously got a target market in, in mind. Correct. And that's, that's what sets you apart. These, if you're going to build a new building, you want to make sure you have the ESFR sprinkling system. You want to make sure you have, uh, you know, the, the higher clear height, because now users are using that cubic square feet. It's not just the, the, the square feet, right? Not just the floor space. They're going, they're stacking high, they're racking high. Um, and, but also what, like Michael said at, at the beginning, we're seeing our requirements, our tenant requirements have been, we're seeing large, more and more of these larger users coming in. It used to be eight to 10. <laughs> we used to tell people, what's the hot spot? What's the sweet spot? Eight to 10. Yeah, not anymore. There, there's a lot of larger users that are, that are coming in. Um, cause it's been kind of, a, we've been kind of a neglected market, I think over the years, just being isolated and now we're, we're kind of discovered and, and services need to come here. Yep. We're on the map and we're here to stay. Well, I want to thank all the attendees. Thank you, Surf Pro Boise for sponsoring this panel. Surf Pro Boise sponsors in water, fire, storm damage, and mold remediation, as well as other commercial services. Reach out to them if you guys need anything. And thanks to our panel. I appreciate everyone attending. Have a good day.